Um, this is the biggest search we've had in quite some time, so I'll give yourself a round of applause. I present the material last night, I don't know where I am. Um, I guess I don't really need to say that this is, we're at the top of a roller coaster right now, 2020, and we need everybody's energy and excitement and dollars and volunteer times over the next nine months, 11 months, sorry. Um, to uh, put some things straight that need to be put straight in this country and in the state. Um, I'm excited for it. I'm excited by this level of enthusiasm. I was concerned after uh, after 2018 that you know, all of the energy that was spent on uh, you know taking back the executive branch of the Michigan uh, of Michigan state government and flipping the House, flipping the Congress, at least the House of Representatives and Congress uh, to Democrats, that people would lose energy they would feel like the job was done, and that clearly is not happening. We still have an enormous amount of enthusiasm. Uh, we are motivated every day by the things that uh, Trump and his administration are doing, and we just literally cannot take the foot off the gas pedal. So I'm really encouraged to see this level of engagement, even at the local level, um, heading into 2020. So thank you for, for being here. Um, just to put a plug in for our uh, email list, if you are not on our email list, you should go to washingtonagenda.org and sign up for it. Uh, we send out a couple of emails every week to keep them informed about what's happening. Um, our newsletter has gotten you know, steadily better and better, and I think uh, people are finding it to be very useful. Also on our website is our calendar, and we endeavor to put as much of uh, what's happening around the county uh, and even the state on there so that you know what's happening um, regarding candidates and, and forums and, and all sorts of activities that are related to Democrats. Um, and then finally, there's our Facebook page, on, uh, which is Washtenaw Dems, and our Twitter feed, which is at Washtenaw Dems, you might sense a theme here. Um, but please uh, sign up for all those things, and especially get, get on our email list. Um, I'm excited for today's forum. Uh, this is an example of how good the quality, of, or the, how, how deep our bench is in terms of candidates in the Democratic Party. We have three great candidates. Um, looking forward to hearing from them today. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Olga, and she's going to get things started. Thank you very much. There are chairs over here. If you're standing, you want to sit. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, meeting two candidates that are running for the county prosecutor. Uh, it's a very important position. Thank you. Can everybody hear me now? Oh, good. Uh, it's a very important position in that it's responsible for, for deciding who will be charged for crimes and misdemeanors and exactly what those charges are. Among the key tasks that they have is also preventing racial and economic bias in uh, their decisions. The three candidates that we have today are Hugo Mack. He's a defense attorney, former Washington <coughs> County Chief Assistant Public Defender. Next to him is Ellie Sabbath, who's senior advisor and counsel to Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan. He's also a lecturer at the University of Michigan Law School, and he's a former law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And our final candidate is Ariane Slate, a senior assistant city attorney for Ann Arbor. She also was the assistant county prosecutor from 2006 to 2017. So let's give a pause for the <laughs> Each candidate is going to begin the program with a statement and introduce and as they introduce themselves. Then we're going to turn it over to you, the audience, for questions. And uh, we have a large audience, so we're going to try and get in as many of the questions that we can. The program will end then with the candidates uh, giving their final statements for the last two, uh, two minutes each. And when you ask the question, you can address them to one of the candidates, two of the candidates, or all three of the candidates. Because of the size of the audience, we've asked the candidates to try to limit their answers to your questions to two minutes. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Eli Nathans, who help me put this program together and he will handle the questions.
kind of old. I will try to make myself uh, comprehensible. Anyway, first, you should all know that this uh, session is being live streamed to Ipsy Live. Uh, and it is also being video recorded. If the Michigan Democratic Party permits us to post it, we will. Uh, Hugo Max's campaign is also video recording. So the conclusion is don't do anything you don't want to be um, with you for a long time. Um, the, the procedure will be that um, each candidate will have two minutes to answer questions. The questions may be posed to one, two, or three candidates. If you ask a question, would you please state your name before you ask the question? Uh, we have, our timekeeper for today is Kathleen Murphy. Would please indicate that? She will hold up a yellow card when there are 30 seconds left in the two minute time period, and a red card uh, when time is up. So we will try to get in as many questions and as many responses as possible. Um, please don't applaud. applaud. Uh, and please keep questions to matters of substance. Uh, and before the start of this meeting, one of you came up to me and said, you know, you're going to have a hard time controlling this crowd. So, uh, we'll see how it goes. With um, no more to say for me, I'd like to start the introductions, start at this end of the table, move down to um, Ariana Slay at the end, and when the two-minute conclusions are stated, we will start at the opposite end with Ariana Slay and move towards me. Um, Mr. Mack. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm giving instruction on how to hold this microphone. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. So, first of all, I'd like to thank the Democratic Party for hosting this. This is truly a crucial time in our history. Ladies and gentlemen, in terms of me, it is one thing to talk about this sort of justice and say you believe in it. It's quite something else to be the living, breathing example of it. That's what I offer you, the citizens of Washington County, this sort of justice. I'm going to be very respectful of the time constraints put on us. So let me tell you what I'm talking about this sort of justice for. For you, the people, and electing me. For the victim for the defendant, for the person coming back from the penitentiary, for the African American community, for the Caucasian community, for the person who was steeped in criminality, and for the person who considers themselves, rightfully so, a feminist or a guardian of women's rights. So in the time frame I have, I'm going to try to address some of those things, but please, in the question and answer period, please ask me about the categories I've told you. Well, what does restorative justice mean for you in terms of electing me? It means electing a person who doesn't scratch his head unless it itches. I don't look down unless I'm picking up something or marking my way. And I don't shuffle my feet unless I'm getting ready to dance. It means a person who is accountable to you. You are the people that I look for for endorsement and support, no one else. What does it mean in terms of me? It means electing a prosecutor who knows the difference between justice and just us. These are discussions that we all have to have in this nation. Racial inequity, privilege do in fact exist. And the only way we're going to heal the divide in this nation is by addressing those issues. In terms of the defendant, what does it mean? It means no overcharging, no railroading, full constitutional rights, fair sentencing. If you're the person coming back from the penitentiary, what does it mean? Within the first 90 days of my administration, I've already met with your permission with the Michigan Department of Corrections. We're going to have a summit. My office and the Department of Corrections extolling to all employers in this county the virtues of hiring somebody coming back from the penitentiary. They have a right to be respected and reintegrated back into society. Thank you so much. I hope you ask any questions to follow up. All right. Well, uh, echo thanks to the Washtenaw County Democratic Party for putting on this forum. Uh, thanks to uh, both my competitors for what I'm sure is going to be a robust exchange of ideas. And I really want to thank everybody here for coming out for this important conversation. Uh, I only have two minutes, so uh, I'm not going to bore you with my bio, uh, but I will say, you know, I've, I've been a lawyer for, for 10 years. I've litigated at every level of the court system, both in the state of Michigan and uh, federally, including at the Michigan Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court. Um, my current job, I oversee a portfolio of thousands of cases for the city of Detroit, public interest cases, among other things, you know, we're suing the opioid industry. We are going after banks and slumlords that maintain their homes in uninhabitable, uninhabitable conditions for residents. Uh, it's work that I'm proud of. I am running for county prosecutor here at my home because our system desperately needs reform. I got into this race last May before the incumbent decided not to run again because I saw the injustice that is being done in our county justice system and has been perpetuated by the county prosecutors. What we are doing now is not working. 
and it is not making us safe. We have in this county a 70%, close to a 70% recidivism rate, which means that 70% of the time, when we impose consequences on people, they are going right back out and committing other crimes. That's because we are failing to address the root cause of criminal behavior. Close to 80% of the people in the justice system here are dealing with some underlying form of substance abuse. We need to address the root causes of crime. Uh, to make sure that we're all safe, to make sure that we have an equitable system. We have a system that is deeply plagued with racial inequity. 70% of the people in our juvenile system are black as opposed to 12% of the general population. I've laid out a platform which I'm uh, looking forward to discussing with you today that focuses on equity, focuses on rehabilitation, focuses on transparency. Again, thank you and I'm looking forward uh, to this conversation. Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Arianne Slay. I am going to ask you to be very patient with me this morning because I am getting over this 10 day cold. Um, and for those of you who I have seen in the last week, I hope I did not spread my germs to you. Um, but I will do my best with my voice this morning. Um, I do come with you not only with a cold, but I come with you of years of experience in the criminal justice system. So I know everything about the minutia. And I had to observe the wrongdoing, which has led to this catastrophic institutional failure. But because I understand the system, I understand how to fix it. And I know a lot of you are worried about, the, about me as a candidate. And that worry comes from, well, you were in the system. You came up in the system. You have years of experience as a prosecutor. It's going to be the same old thing. Let me be the first to tell you if you have not heard it already. One, I am not Brian Mackey. Two, I left the office years ago. I left the office because as a line prosecutor, you cannot make change when you do not have autonomy or authority to do so. And when I left, I went to the city of Ann Arbor where I was able to run the criminal division there. And I have instituted change there. I have brought diversion. I have brought a new sense of purpose in prosecution. We are working in the specialty courts. We have just come to the first ever resolution day for the city of Ann Arbor. Now my jurisdiction is small. I only have the city of Ann Arbor, but what I had was an opportunity and a blank slate and a platform to bring restorative justice to life, to bring the programs that I intend to bring back to the county prosecutor's office. I haven't just read about them everyone. I've been practicing these for years, and I can bring this back to our community. And how do we do that? But through transparency and trust and integrity. As your county prosecutor, I will be the voice and the person who will bring us back to a place where the justice system doesn't have to be there to hurt you, but to help you and to bring you up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to to questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Do I need a microphone? Can you hear me down there? Yeah. So I have a context that I need to say before my question. Everybody come up and use this mic. Okay. My question is for Mr. Hugo Mack. And I have some conscious that I need to hear My question is for Mr. Hugo Mack. I have a context to provide first so that you can understand why I'm asking this question. Uh, Mr. Mack, I was one of your early supporters and on your campaign committee when you announced your run for judge in 1992. And then you were charged with and convicted of criminal sexual conduct first degree, the most serious CSC charge, and felonious assault, crimes perpetrated against a woman with whom you had an intimate relationship. You have never once accepted responsibility for what you did to that woman. You claim to have been wrongfully convicted despite having excellent and vigorous defense counsel and despite repeated appeals. The courts have consistently ruled that the jury verdict was fair and supported by the evidence. The jury found you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I have read the many volumes of trial transcripts and appellate decisions, and I agree. Victims of sexual assault and of intimate partner violence are already reluctant to report these crimes for many reasons. As someone who has worked 
and sacrificed many things over 20 years to end these crimes, I can say without doubt that they will be even more reluctant to report if you are elected prosecutor. They can have absolutely no faith that a convicted sex offender and abuser who attacked the character and credibility of his victim and who, and who still consistently refuses to accept responsibility will do anything to protect them or prosecute their offenders zealously. I do believe that offenders who have served their time have much to contribute to the good of the world and so I ask you this. If you are serious about your concerns for victims, will you do the right thing and dedicate your efforts in a different arena so that those victims cannot lack confidence in the prosecution of their crimes? Will you, sir, bow out of this race? We have two minutes, and the question itself seems like it took about two minutes. Let me answer this directly, and I'm so glad you asked the question. First of all, integrity is something that you do and display when no one is watching. It is a very easy thing, ladies and gentlemen, to bow your knee to pressure to make someone else happy. If you have integrity, and I believe all of you in this room have integrity, ask yourself this fundamental question. If you have been wrongfully accused, charged, and convicted of something, you have a binary choice. You can either bow to the injustice that happened to you, or you can dedicate yourself to fighting back, to come back, to protect and defend others. My scripture teaches me of a man named Joseph. Something very similar happened to him. He had people that castigated him. But through it all, he maintained his integrity. So now we talk about public records. Well, let's talk about the public record from the Michigan Supreme Court when this matter was on leave to appeal. Three justices, and please, all of you who like to look at public records, look at this. Three justices of the Michigan Supreme Court said something very, very wrong happened in Mr. Mack's case. Unfortunately, we needed four votes and got three. So the next time that somebody tells you one vote doesn't make a difference, refer them to two people, myself and Al Gore. Now, in terms of having integrity, when we talk about women, we're not talking about 800 plus women that I defended who were all victims of domestic violence, who I pleaded with the judge to take into consideration domestic violence when they're sentencing them, women who were slated for the penitentiary or the jail that we were able to keep out. In terms of protecting and defending women, not the 33 women now, victims of domestic violence, that I represent pro bono, in terms of helping them with jobs and opportunities, certainly not those women. So I'm very curious as to who these quote-unquote women are. They're certainly not the women who have sons in the penitentiary that I'm trying to help liberate and free. The bottom line is, there is no gain for me being in this race other than the truth. And I'm going to stand on that integrity as I did with the Michigan Parole Board, as I did with the Michigan Supreme Court, and as I did with the Administrative Law Judge. So there's nothing about me to be ashamed or afraid of. Truth will run out, and restorative justice will come to Washington County. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, Next question. Next question. Over here. Yes. yes. Actually, perhaps the individual questions should kind of line up over here. That will help us save time. Morning. My name is William Amadeo. I'm a criminal defense lawyer in Washington. My question is directed to all the candidates. I'm going to start with Prosecutor Slade. Can you explain the current impact of Haiva needing prosecutorial approval for ages 21 to 23? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Haida, the Home Jufil Trainee Act, is a provision in the Michigan law which allows um, a conviction to not actually be a conviction. It allows um, it to stay um, under the outside of the guise of public record. So the only people who would be able to see it are law enforcement. And the um, opportunity uh, changed recently in the law in the last couple of years is for ages 17 to 21, the court could grant HIDA or the special status where somebody didn't have a conviction on their record without the prosecutor consent. Most recently, it changed in between 21 and 24, you need prosecutorial consent. And so that was a, a change in the law which afforded um, a new group of folks to have uh, this special consideration. Now one of the um, issues that I understand happens um, in the county prosecutor's office now is that HIDA is not always liberally granted. Now, what we do know, because when we do better, we know better, is that the youthful mind is still developing at 24, right? And kids are making 
poor judgment. And they are oftentimes bound by their poor judgment. And the scary part about that is we only have one or two people who are making decisions, and sometimes they're not always equitable. Um, at the city attorney's office, HIDA is liberally granted. And that's what I have been doing. There are very few cases um, that I think should not be given HIDA status, and those are for people where there are crimes against people where somebody was hurt very badly, um, or there would violate the Crime Victims' Rights Act. Um, so this change, I believe, that we would be looking for in the administration would be is that HIDA would be liberally granted. It would be an exception for that someone not to get that special sentencing consideration in the future. Thank you very much. I'd like to move on to the next question. We have a lot of questioners. Okay. Right. Did you have, I mean, it went for all three of us. Okay, well, if you try to get your answers first, we have 15 people lined up. Okay, well, well uh, so, so, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I think Erin gave a brief overview of Hyde, so I won't go into that. I will say this. I started my career as an eighth grade U.S. history teacher. I taught special education and general education classes. I was, um, fortunately or unfortunately, once a you know 21 and 22 year old uh, guy. Uh, and I know that people make really dumb mistakes when they are young. The best science tells us that the brain is developing up to and including the mid 20s. When you look at statistics, you see that uh, people actually tend to age out of crime. There's not a lot of 35-year-olds. There are some that are committing crimes. Crime is a young person's game. So, uh, in terms of HIDA, I fully support liberal granting of HIDA. I do not think that a criminal record for something that somebody did when their brain was still developing should uh, be a, a, an albatross around people's neck for the rest of their lives, should prevent them from getting jobs, should prevent them from getting housing, should prevent them from getting education. There is a sea change in how we are thinking about criminal justice in this country. It is a welcome one. We are recognizing that young people are not just mini adults. And as prosecutor with HIDA, but also with sentencing we're recommending, uh, the opportunity for diversion programs, we are going to treat kids like kids. We are going to treat young people like young people. And that is up to and including when they are in their early 20s. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in my career, I've defended hundreds Founds of people where I have requested HIDA. So I have an operative work and understanding of how that is used and sometimes abused. It's interesting hearing some of the comments that were made before. Let me tell you, the current prosecuting attorney's office, when it comes to having prosecutorial uh, approval, very, very stingy in terms of that. That is one process I intend to change. So I don't speak to you from an academic sense. I speak to you from the sense of representing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who I've tried so hard to have height apply to them. So, in fact, perhaps even on a statutory level, okay, removing the approval of the prosecutor. But more importantly, having a prosecutor that's got compassion, compassion, common sense, realizing that our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. People have a right to be reintegrated and not scorn and ridicule perpetually. There are over 300,000 convictions in this state every year. That could be one of you or your family. So the next time somebody tries to get you to smear your nose down at somebody because of some kind of criminal history, that could easily be you or someone that you know. Please remember that. So yes, HIDA should be applied liberally. It should be there for people to rebuild. But I must say, if I'm Lexington County Prosecutor, protecting you and your families is first and foremost. So it's not going to be a blanket slate because protecting you and your papers, you and your right to come and go, is going to be my primary responsibility. We want to give people a chance to rehabilitate, but we do not want to have a revolving door on crime, ladies and gentlemen, because that does not benefit you, the people. So yes, thank you so much for your time and attention on this matter. Thank you. Hi, I'm Audrey Anderson, and I have a question for all three candidates. My question is, what policies and practices will you bring to reshape decisions in the following? I have seven, but I cut them down <laughs> for sake of time to uh, four. <laughs> Charging, bail, case 
processing, diversion programs, I must add one more, sentence. Thank you. Right. I'm going to go to who starts answering these questions. So I'm going to start now with Mr. Sabat. Okay, uh, that's a lot. So, first and foremost, I'll start with the charging because the charging decision is perhaps the most important that a prosecutor has. Everybody in the criminal justice system is fundamentally playing on the field that is set out by the prosecutor. The prosecutor decides whether to charge something in the first place, with what to charge them and I'm bringing in some other parts of your question here, whether, whether you are eligible for a diversion program or whether you go through the traditional criminal justice system. My perspective on charging and on the availability of diversion programs <coughs> is that we should only be charging to a level that is necessary to either rehabilitate, to protect the safety of the community, um, and that's it. I do not believe in retribution as a form of justice. I do not believe that we should be locking people behind bars for years and years and years, serving no benefit to society uh, at tremendous expense to taxpayers, uh, simply because we are mad at them. So, whenever possible, we are going to divert people. We are not going to charge them even. We, we, we are going to divert them into rehabilitation and treatment options. If they are dealing with an underlying addiction issue, if they are dealing with a mental health issue. That is not just the more compassionate thing to do. It makes all of us safer. Because again, we have close to a 70% recidivism rate in this county. So clearly what we are doing in terms of our charging decisions, and in terms of our punitive system of justice, is working. Uh, okay, two minutes is a very short period of time. Uh, I categorically oppose cash bail, and I hope we get more opportunity to discuss this. Cash bail is by its terms an inequitable system. It means that poor people who are not dangerous to society sit in jail for months sometimes simply because they can't afford an amount of money that the wealthier among us could uh, bring out of their pocket pretty easily, whereas wealthier people who do pose a threat to society are able to buy their way out of jail. It is inequitable, it is reflective of the two-track system of justice that we have in this county and in the United States of America, and I am absolutely committed to ending it as prosecutor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mack. Ladies and gentlemen, do you remember the different categories I told you I'd like to talk about this sort of justice? Well, let me address charging and bail in terms of the defendant. Ladies and gentlemen, in terms of charging, remember I said no overcharging, no railroading? I meant that. I meant that. Because far too often, a defendant is overcharged as a negotiation ploy with them in terms of reaching some kind of plea agreement. That will end. When I'm the prosecutor, when I put a charge, that's the charge I feel is fair and proper. It is not going to be negotiated again. It's not going to be like a, a chip or something on a roulette table, all right? So in terms of charging, the charging will be fair, regardless of the person's background. I'm not going to hold anything against anybody, but remember, my job is to protect you and your families. So I'm all for appropriate reform, but I am not a legislator. I am a prosecutor. Please do not confuse the two functions, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot meld the two together. You would do a disservice to both. So in terms of charging, there's going to be fair charging. In terms of bail, as your prosecutor, my job is to uphold the law. The supreme law of the land is called the Constitution. The Eighth Amendment prohibits excessive bail. By having a fair charge, we will address excessive bail, because the bail will not be excessive. Now, we can all be in favor of limiting cash bail, but I cannot impact that as a prosecutor. I can impact bail by having a fair charge. I can impact bail by being sure that the charge that we bring against a citizen is a fair and just one. In terms of diversion, I believe in diversion. I believe that incarceration should be a final option, not a first choice. However, if we can make a person whole, remember what I said about the victim? Okay, giving a person a sense of dignity, even an apology. Sometimes the diversion is appropriate. But my goal is to protect you first and foremost. And in protecting you, I'll protect the rights of everyone else. In terms of sentencing, fair sentencing. That's what you're going to get with me, fair sentencing. That's all my prosecutors and I are going to do that. We're not going to try to goad somebody and hurt somebody. I spent time in the penitentiary. I understand. We can eliminate our prison population of about 5,800 people and still have perfect safety for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, my quick rundown in terms of 
bail. I do not believe that anyone should be incarcerated simply because they cannot afford bail. You should be incarcerated if you are a danger to someone else or to yourself. Um, I have worked very hard with the Washtenaw County Sheriff, Jerry Clayton, on the LEAD program, which is Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. So it is my goal to bring forth a LEAD program in 2021, and that program will be for those who present to the criminal justice system in crisis for mental health or crisis who are for substance abuse. They will be screened, they will be treated, they will be diverted away from the criminal justice system if they are not a danger to someone else. They should not be in our jail. Our jail is not a mental health facility. That is unfortunately what it has become. And that they have been triaged there only to be kicked out and then put right back into the criminal justice system and it's a vicious circle. So that is what I will be working for to stop. In terms of charging, you need to be cognizant of that, but we don't know what the root issue is when you are making a charging decision. This is the minutia I'm talking about. When you're making a charging decision, you have 24 hours, somebody may be in custody. You can't hold them in jail indefinitely. You have to make a decision based on the information that is provided for you. What I will be lobbying for to our county commission is that there is an increase in public defender funding and an increase in prosecutor funding because you have the kind of criminal justice system that you're willing to pay for. When we have those candid conversations about what the need <coughs> is for that particular individual because we will have individual case management, gone will be the blanket policies of the prosecutor's office where everyone gets treated the same. Gone will be those policies and we will look at people's individuals and find out what they need so that they do not end up back in the criminal justice system. Thank you, thank you very and much. And the community will be safe. Next question, Mr. Max. Good morning. Uh, my name is Guy Conti. I'm a local attorney. I've been practicing here in Washtenaw County for a little more than 14 years. Uh, first, thanks to the candidates for showing up today and to the party for holding the event. Um, in those 14 years, I've done hundreds of mental health cases. I'm not a criminal defense attorney, but I've done a bunch of dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds of civil mental health cases. And it, it would be silly to to look at those cases and not see the intersection with the criminal justice system. I'm glad Ms. Slay started mentioning mental health. Um, as, as many people out there may not know, the prosecutor handles most mental health uh, prosecution, so to speak. They're not criminal cases, but they represent the, the, uh, the petitioner when someone is looking at a mental health uh, commitment. Uh, what I've seen in all that time is, is a lot of people who are mentally ill but not meeting the clinical definition of, of insanity for criminal defense really falling through the cracks, really not getting the treatment they need. Um, and I realize that there's a dual purpose uh, to protect society, but also uh, when we talk about restorative justice, what are, what are we doing uh, with these mental, the mentally ill people? And the question's for the whole panel, which is, Given, given the idea that all of you have expressed in terms of restorative justice, if not using that phrase, what can you as a prosecutor do, given the constraints of the law today, or perhaps since you're a partisan candidate, as an advocate with the legislature, to promote different policies to, to uh, uh, provide restorative justice for the mentally ill people in this county that are slipping through the cracks but, but in, 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 in droves? And that, that would be my question for the whole panel. Well, one thing we need to do is encourage courts, to the circuit court, to take mental health issues quite seriously. That's one thing we need to do, because circuit court handles all felonies, okay? We do have a mental health, per se, protocol in a district court level, but we do need something formative in a circuit court level. Now, one thing we can do in terms of mental health is analyze that in terms of a charge. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one thing about me, which will always point like a compass north, your public safety is first and foremost in my mind. So if a person is mentally ill, for example, and is going out stabbing people, my concern is removing that person from society and stabbing you or your family. Okay? We'll deal with the mental health issue secondly. We will deal with public safety first. Okay? So let me make that real clear to everybody in this room. Your public safety is first and foremost. So now in terms of mental health, there are a lot of people falling through the cracks. You know, under the Angler administration, they closed the Lafayette Clinic, where a lot of people were getting mental health 
And those people had a pipeline from the streets right to the jail. So I understand that. But some of that is on a legislative level. So to answer the question directly, as prosecutor, my concern is in dealing with mental health because it is a public safety issue. It's an issue for protecting those individuals, an issue for protecting you. So a person's not going to be overcharged, okay, when I understand them, like anybody else, has got a mental health issue. We have to work within the system. I want to change the system. But as a prosecutor, statutorily, there are things that I'm simply limited in doing. So in terms of mental health, I want diversion. I want treatment. I want those things to be applied because it's going to be a public safety issue. So it's a very difficult question because a prosecutor's got statutory limitations. The prosecutor's not a legislator. So we can be sympathetic to it, and that's why I'm going to be sympathetic to it, and each case will get my individual attention on that health. Thank you so much. Ms. Sight. Well, I think there's a couple of things that we can do about it. So I'm a current member, and I have been for several years, of the Mental Health Court. And the Mental Health Court um, team is amazing, and it is my goal to encourage that all probation services um, for those in our county look like Mental Health Court. And it really is a circling of the wagons around people who are in crisis so that when they leave the criminal justice system they are in a better place and we're talking about housing services for those who have housing insecurity mental health services substance abuse services absolutely anything that you could possibly need <coughs> but in terms of mental health i've been there i've been that docket prosecutor that every wednesday will hold 20 or 30 mental health hearings for commitment and you're right there are a lot of people who are slipping through the cracks and it's frightening but i think that we have an opportunity with our current mental health court. What I have seen is that when people leave the court, um, there are occasions where we're, they come back within a year or two. And it's because they don't have um, the proper orders to continue their treatment. So we have to, CMH has to wait until they're in crisis again to petition them to get them back under orders. Um, there is um, something that they're doing out in Kalamazoo County, which is pretty amazing right now, which is a lesser order, which is an, an AOT. Um, which is an alternative orders for treatment. And I think that can actually be helpful. And there's an opportunity that we could apply through the state court administrator's office that would allow the district court to actually provide that same order and give that same level of service to our consumers in the community. So I'm looking forward to that. That might be a possibility. Um, for those people who are in the mental health court, as a city prosecutor, I offer deferred sentences for everyone, which means they don't leave with a criminal record. All they have to do is be engaged in treatment. And so I think that um, pushes them out of the criminal justice system, helps them start with a fresh start back in the community, and then keeps them engaged with their community caseworkers and community supports. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, we'll start first. So first did you not answer that question? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, so, so I think we need to look this square in the eye, and, and we can talk up here about diversion, uh, to mental health treatment programs all we want. But the fact of the matter is, is, as Hugo said, mental health in this state has been cut to the bone starting in the Angler administration, and that needs to change. We need more resources. Up here, we're all lawyers. We can talk about diversion, we can talk about treatment, but we need professionals in place that are able to serve the people that are dealing with mental health crises, and we don't <laughs> currently have the resources to do it. Now, what can I do as prosecutor? I have committed that the first non-lawyer position that I have open in the prosecutor's office is going to be a grant writer. And it's going to be a grant writer that doesn't just try to get money in for the prosecutor's office. We are going to work with community organizations to try to get in as many federal and state resources as possible to bolster our mental health treatment facilities to get more beds in the county, substance abuse, uh, youth programs, the like. We're going to go after major philanthropic money. I think that we can serve as a model for the rest of the state and show that investment up front saves money on the back end. If you invest in people's health up front, we're not paying to incarcerate them down the line. So that's one thing you can do as prosecutor. I understand the prosecutor is not a legislator. But it's, I, I have to say, uh, you know, to say that the prosecutors don't have any sway over what the legislature does is just not true. The Prosecutors Association of Michigan is one of the most powerful lobbying groups in this state. The legislature listens to them on criminal justice related matters. As prosecutor, I am going to use every single ounce of political capital we have through the Prosecutors Association of Michigan and in my own personal capacity to lobby the legislature to stand up and say, look, 
We need to invest up front in mental health. We need to address, uh, invest up front in substance abuse treatment. We need to invest up front in our kids. Thank you very much. Next question. Hello, my name is Brenda McKinney, and um, I have a question for you. You're all talking about equity, and I want to make you aware that we have lost, and I don't know if you are aware, but we have lost 991 affordable rental units since 2015 due to market rate. How is this, how is the decreasing of affordable housing in Washington County going to affect affect your jobs? This is becoming a very serious issue in Washington County. Thank you so much. Ms. Slade, you want to start? Um, you're right, and uh, thank you for asking that question. And we've lost 991 since about 2015, and I think we've only gotten 31 of those rentals back. Um, it is alarming, it's scary, and it has put a strain on the eastern side of our county. Um, and so we do have to acknowledge that that has definitely put a strain not just on our criminal justice system, but it put a, a strain everywhere. Um, I think what we as uh, you know, prosecutors to be, what we can look at is how that ties into the criminal justice system. Because when you have housing insecurity, you have insecurities of other kinds as well. You're looking at uh, people who are underinsured. So you're looking at mental health issues. You're looking at overall wellness issues. You're looking at unequal access to education. And that all filters in to criminal justice. It is not urban legend that they are building prisons across this country based on third grade reading levels. That is not urban legend, that is true. We need to acknowledge that and invest in our community, invest in our children. Um, we need to make sure that we are, when we are looking at our juvenile cases, is that we are treating our kids like juveniles, but that we are also circling the wagons around their families and making sure that they have appropriate housing and making sure that they have appropriate um, funding so that they are eating every day. And I know that se doesn't seem like much to many of us in this room, but if you are not eating every day, <laughs> learning and coming to school, that's the last thing that is on your mind. That our children are safe in their own homes. So as prosecutor, we can say, oh, housing doesn't have, that doesn't have much to do with us, but it has everything to do with us. So really um, investing in our children and looking to see how we are handling our juvenile cases and how we can step into the juvenile role in our juvenile cases and really circle the wagons around those families to help. Thank you so much, Mr. Senator. I'll generally agree with all that. Uh, we, need to, we need to invest in kids, we need to invest in housing. Um, the housing shortage uh, in Washtenaw County, the lack of affordable housing, is criminogenic. It causes crime. The two biggest things that you can do to make sure that somebody is not going to commit uh, an act that hurts others is to make sure that person has a stable job and to make sure that, that person has secure housing. So it is crucial for our criminal justice system that we have equitable access to housing across all income levels in this county. Now beyond that, uh, oftentimes what you see is that people that are returning citizens People that have criminal records are unable to access housing. They're unable to access jobs. And so while we can't control the, the, the housing rates directly, at least you know, unless somebody tells me some, some hope that we have, what we can do is we can make sure not only that we are not saddling people with criminal records that don't deserve them, but that we are helping them to wipe those records clean once they have done everything that we have asked for as a society. That is why I have proposed that as prosecutors, we are going to help people who have done everything they're supposed to, who have stayed out of trouble, expunge their criminal records. This is stuff that we do in the city of Detroit. We have attorneys that are working full time to help people with expungements. We build a firewall from the folks that are prosecuting cases. Um, but it is a very powerful program. And think about it, the county prosecutor did that. We'd be wiping records clean and getting access to housing, access to jobs, to hundreds if not thousands of people. And it would also send a message. The prosecutor's office is not just about putting up barriers for you, uh, that prevent success in society, but if you do everything we ask of you, 
we are going to help you tear those barriers down. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, in terms of expungement, as your county prosecutor, I cannot help somebody get their record expunged, all right? That is a blatant conflict of interest, in my opinion. What we can do, ladies and gentlemen, is have resources to refer people to help them get their records expunged. That is simply a fact, and I'm sorry. Now, what do we have to do to address the problem? First, let's understand the history. We celebrate 400 years of African Americans being in this nation now. I'm sure most of you know that. Ever since the inception of slavery and indentured servitude, we have had a disparity in terms of income and wealth. This goes way back to the history of this nation and continues today. We never got 40 acres in a mule. We didn't even get the mule. So we have to understand how these things have had a disparate impact all along. If you've got money, housing is not an issue. Housing is an issue for marginal and poor people. I understand. I've seen black folks moved out of God Street, okay, where I, where I grew up on. I understand exactly what that's like. So how do we address it? Well, with, once again, with all due respect, within the confines of a prosecutor, there's only so much I can do. I can certainly personally encourage programs, but I can tell you this, in terms of charging somebody, that's, that's going to impact how much bail they have to put up until the system is, is changed. In terms of having mental health awareness, that's going to impact it also. So in terms of housing, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to do is to keep people back in the community. Incarceration should be a final option, not a first choice. Because if you're out there, at least you have the chance of getting employment. You can't get employed if you're in the jail, ladies and gentlemen. If you're out there, you have the basis for a family structure, keeping your family together. Broken families are a major contributor to crime in this nation. No father figure, no mother figure. So what I can do as a prosecutor with the limitations of the law is try to put as many people on the streets who are not a menace to human society so they can work and perhaps get insurance and increase their life and get decent housing. That's my honest, straightforward answer. Thank you very much. First, first person answer. Next question, Mr. Seven. Question all three ladies, shorter for your and Arion. The county prosecutor would have to work closely with police and look at co police case files. It's uh, in order to do that, you need to pass a criminal background check to get Michigan State Police File Access or FBI access. Uh, first, Eli Arion, can you pass a criminal background check? And then, Mr. Mack, I believe you can. Uh, you asked us to look at the public record. Um, I did. When you were under duress, you sought to bypass Michigan's rape shield laws to protect victims. So this, this uh, means law enforcement information network system regulation to protect all of us. Do you plan to bypass that regulation? And if not, how will you prosecute without looking at police case files? Thank you. Please grab your other mic. Mr. Sandit, if you start with that. Yes, I can pass a criminal background check. Uh, I have access to lean now in my day job. Thank you. Mr. Mack? Ladies and gentlemen, I've been waiting for this question. Okay. <coughs> Let me tell you something. If I can't pass a, pass a criminal background check, my assistant surely can. Okay? Red hair. Now, secondly, ladies and gentlemen, secondly, in terms of the statement by the <coughs> uh, I respect him coming to these forums and asking the same kinds of statements. I understand. I think his name is Dirk. Glad to see you again, Dirk. Ladies and gentlemen, Dirk Mayhew, in, sir. in terms of correct, Dirk Mayhew, we will make him famous today. <laughs> Start getting some family now. Because every time Can the gentleman shows up, he asks that same question. So now, what I'm saying to you is, is this. In terms of talking about 1993, you know that some people keep going no. back to that? Well, let me tell you something. When you're a criminal defendant, you have a right to defend yourself. And if there's an exception to quote unquote the rape shield law that applies, you have every right to defend yourself. So unless Mr. Mayhew or those who support him feel that a criminal defendant should not be afforded every opportunity to defend themselves, then please don't criticize somebody for affording that. They certainly wouldn't want their criminal trial to be uh, somehow short term, uh, short, uh, given short attention or bias because the person defended themselves. And once again, once again, it's so interesting to hear people talk about 1993 and they put a period. That really shows you what that is. Because a true person who's interested in justice, they look at a time continuum. The parole board in 2003, they looked at 1993. Never said I was guilty. I can't tell you I'm guilty of something I didn't do. That's called integrity. The administrative law judge looked at the parole board, and they looked at 1993. Said, Mr. Mack, we're going to release you. The Michigan Supreme Court itself. So all these questions about 1993, if your question is one of integrity, of one of character, my greatest character and integrity references are the seven people on the Michigan Supreme Court. 
So if there's a question about that, ladies and gentlemen, and you're going to be fair, judge a book, ladies and gentlemen, after you've read all of it. Don't judge it by what somebody says about it. You can make your own decisions. I stand on my integrity. I stand on my ability to represent you in the fullest extent of the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Slate? Uh, yes, I'm a current lean operator. I have been since 2005. Thank you very much. Mr. Mack, we'll answer this question. Tad Weiser, We Rock, and John Valley Area Labor Federation. Just a, a kind of a broader question for all three of you that shouldn't take long. Um, but for, the, for those of us that think that real fundamental criminal justice reform necessarily is going to need a lot more participation from grassroots people, from new leaders, from new communities, um, a key part of building a cross-racial progressive movement is not just what you all may do in office, but I think it has to do with how you, with what happens during your campaigns, what happens after. And my question just be, can, uh, if you're able, each of you is just able to briefly name an example or two of how your campaign is working right now to build a cross-racial progressive movement. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Ladies and gentlemen, in terms of my campaign building a cross-racial progressive movement, there is no greater example of a cross-racial progressive movement than restorative justice, because that concept involves everybody, and particularly African Americans who have been at the losing end, the short end of the state of the criminal justice system. So the fact that I'm running, the fact that a person's had to overcome the things I've overcome to be in front of you today is simple of my dedication to a cross-racial progressive movement. We are all better together than we are apart, but we cannot build a cross-racial progressive movement if we do not understand and respect history, ladies and gentlemen, history. And the history of this nation is one steeped in racism and privilege. We have to start having an honest discussion about it. So I can't invite anybody to be with me who is in denial, and that's African Americans and Caucasians as well. Everything that has beset African Americans has not been in the hands of somebody else. It's been by poor choices of some people in our own community. We've got to accept that. So in terms of being biracial, in terms of being multicultural, in my office, my office will represent the community. It will represent all of you. But we do so with equality. Speaking as an African American, my quest has never been for superiority. It's been for equality. So we're going to respect people's rights and invite everybody to come in. But you've got to come in understanding. We're not going to pick winners and losers anymore. We're not going to discriminate against people because of their income, because of their social economic status, and we're certainly not going to discriminate against anybody because of their gender. So I agree with what Mr. Weiser said. So we have to do it, but we do it by example. And what a great example would be for people in Washington County to show multiculturalism, all right, and biracial and acceptance than by electing somebody who's had to come back from the hardships I've come back to. We can represent by symbolism and action, ladies and gentlemen, and that's exactly what I offer you today. Thank you so much. This is funny. So, um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer specifically a, a campaign focus. Um, for those of you who are willing to join or who are willing to participate in this movement for institutional change, all are welcome. Um, all races, all nationalities, everyone is welcome um, to participate. Um, I, but I can't tell you from experience as to what I've brought forth in my career. So. Um, currently, I work for the city of Ann Arbor, and one of my jobs is to bring training protocol, uh, protocols for the police. And so I have made a very concerted effort to bring um, racial diversity training to the police department, something that they have not had um, possibly ever that I am aware of, um, and I think that that has really been beneficial for the departments. I think that going forward, that is something that I will be bringing not only to uh, the Washington County Prosecutor's Office, but I've been reaching out to some of our community partners. Um, uh, one of my very uh, esteemed uh, colleagues in one of, uh, it's a contiguous county, I would say, has been very helpful in um, giving some advice on how to recruit diversity into the office as well. And, I um, appreciate diversity in ethnicity, but I also appreciate diversity in thought. Um, I can tell you that I was only the third African-American female to ever work in, in the prosecutor's office. 
And that was kind of a hard, a hard come up. It's something to acknowledge. But what I'm looking for, uh, for future assistants and for future people who are willing to serve the county, is diversity of thought. For people who are looking to be uh, more progressive than I am, to change the generation and to change the culture of the county prosecutor's office, and to really challenge the system as we have it now. And so that's exact, that's the diversity that I'm looking for. Thank you so much. Well, it starts by showing up. And, you know, I've been on the campaign trail for over a half a year now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I go to community events, neighborhood association meetings across the county. Uh, I show up at, you know, the, the Washington My Brother's Keeper events on Saturday mornings. Uh, that's, you know, a, a program that's geared towards providing mentorship opportunities for young black men that I think is going to be a crucial partner uh, if we want to really build out a justice system that is focused on not imposing punitive consequences, but rather on building communities up. I'll say this, I've been disappointed when I show up across the county to see that there's not usually representation from the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor's office currently, as it's currently situated, seems to exist you know, sort of behind closed doors in downtown Ann Arbor, doesn't get out much into the community, doesn't build those bridges, isn't present. I'm doing this, you know, as part of a campaign, of course, and you asked what we've been doing in the campaign in terms of building bridges, but I intend to continue doing it as prosecutor. The prosecutor and the prosecutor's office should not just be sitting in downtown Ann Arbor in these, in these nice offices. They need, we, they, we need to be out in the community to build alliances, to build trust, because ultimately criminal justice reform isn't something that the prosecutor can do on their own. We need everybody. We need to involve schools. We need to involve community organizations. We need to involve neighborhood organizations to build a system that we can be proud of. That's what I've been uh, starting to do on this campaign. I'm going to continue doing it as prosecutor. I'll just briefly mention that you know we have a robust racial equity plank of our campaign. We also have one that's inclusive, not just of uh, racial equity, but also uh, uh, take stock of the unique needs of our immigration community, which the county prosecutor's office plays a big role in determining whether they are safe. It's something that's been a centerpiece of my campaign from the beginning. I'm going to continue to build alliances and build bridges to make it a reality. Thank you very much. Mr. Mack, would you be first to answer this question? Hi, I'm Suzanne Perkins. Um, I have a question for all three of you about drug court. Um, AA and 12-step programs were written about 80 years ago by somebody who wasn't a scientist. Um, they have been shown to be equally as effective as other self-help and um, support groups. Um, however, among the subgroup of people who are mandated to go, they have been shown to be as equally effective as doing nothing. Uh, the things that are effective are uh, addressing underlying health condition, mental health conditions, uh, medication, harm reduction, and CBT, and I'm curious how you would um, change the drug court system to um, support current science of um, substance abuse. We'll change it, ladies and gentlemen, by sending out a message. The prosecuting attorney, the person that you elect prosecutor, will have tremendous power and authority and influence in this county. We send a message to our judges, and we know the judiciary is different. Executive, that we need to start fundamentally addressing these problems. We are not going in depth enough in addressing the problems. Because remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't remember anything about my campaign, my candidacy, remember this. Everything that I do is addressed towards the safety of you and your families. If we can address the drug issue, then that means there's a person that's going to be mentally healed, prayerfully. That means it's a person that's not going to be going out breaking into your car in order to support a drug habit. Everything I'm doing is addressed to you and your public safety. So as a prosecutor, you better believe it. We're going to be a bully pulpit. But ladies and gentlemen, once again, with all due respect, some of these issues are above and beyond the purview of the prosecutor. We can recommend treatment, okay, but we cannot order treatment, all right? Only the court has got the authority to do that. We've got some very important elections coming up, ladies and gentlemen, in this county. So we really need to be asking our judges, what do you feel about the drug situation? Do we need to expand programs? Hopefully the answer to that question is yes. Then we need to support those candidates who take this issue seriously. 
in terms of myself, once again, I'm going to keep repeating this. Everything I say and do is addressed to the safety of you and your families. So if a person got a drug problem, of course I want them to get treated. But I don't want that person going out breaking into your car or robbing you with a gun. That's what I do not want. Your public safety is first and foremost. We need social reform. We need justice. And everything the questioner said is true. So to repeat my answer, we're going to be a bully pulpit. We're going to ask people to pay attention to these people that are going to be elected judges. And we're going to pay close attention. And we're going to be inclusive, ladies and gentlemen. We are all better together than we are apart. So I understand the need for truth. And I understand the need for help. We're going to address that as best we can as prosecutor. Thank you so much. This time. And ma'am, I didn't lose you in the crowd. Okay, thank you. Um, so the 14B, Ypsilanti Township, is where we currently have our drug court. But right now, Judge Conkey has a grant to explore having a felony drug court in the 22nd Circuit Court. So AA is part of that protocol that was written into the grant funding that comes from the state. But the prosecutor's office is a member of that team. So I was a member at one point of the 14B drug court. We can change. Part of that is that educational component. And so as your elected prosecutor, we need to keep evolving. We do better when we know better. We do that through education. We do that through consistently revamping and making sure that we are using the up-to-date research, up-to-date science, that we are giving the best for our community. So when you have additional information and you've got better science to proffer to the group, you bring that to the table and you make sure that when the next grant solicitation comes in, which you have to report back every single year, is that you include that and you send that to the state of Michigan for your funding and say, this is an alternative that we would like to offer and see if the state is willing to accept that. And so that is something that I was willing to be do. If you are, if you do have that information, I have a couple of people in the back of the room, Alex and Yaz, hey, Alex and Yaz. If you want to share that information with them, I will pass that along. We do better when we know better, so thank you. Yeah, so, so, so we need to meet people where they are. And uh, AA is, is a program that works for some people. It does not work for everybody. Uh, and we need to be cognizant of that, both when we are looking at the drug courts, but also when we're looking at you know what can count for pre-charge diversion into addiction treatment. Uh, I'm a believer that there, you know, look, the science shows there is there is not one right answer. Some people need medication-assisted treatment. Some people can 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 often get sober without it. We need to again meet people where they are, take stock of the fact that addiction is really hard to kick, and oftentimes people do have relapses, and if they do, we want to make sure, you mentioned harm reduction, that uh, it's taking place in as, in as safe a way as possible, and we're not kicking them out of a program uh, simply because they had a relapse. We need, generally, in our judicial system and in our prosecution system, to catch up with the science. And we need to take stock of the fact that addiction is, you know, it is a public health crisis. I do not believe fundamentally that addiction is a criminal matter and that we are doing <coughs> good by punishing people because they are sick. And when people are sick, you need to do everything possible to get them better in an individualized fashion. There is no one-size-fits-all treatment. That is something I will advocate for as prosecutor, and I thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Um, this will be the first to answer this question. Good morning. My name is Jack Wagner. I'm a resident of Lodi Township. Um, the U.S. Constitution Sixth Amendment tells me that if I'm charged with something, I have the right to a trial. However, from the data I've read, some 94%, uh, I think, across the U.S. state cases end in a plea deal, and 97% of federal cases. Furthermore, the federal number has gone up. In 2005, it was 84%, now it's 97 There's really not much more room to grow that number. Um, so I have a question that's three parts. First of all, what do you think is behind this number? Uh, what's causing it? Number two, um, number two is, forgive me, <laughs> What, what can we do maybe to change that number? And do you think that number is too high? Yeah, so that's a, do you think that number is too high? And then what can we do to change it if you think that number is too high? Thank you. 
Um, so quickly, the number is absolutely too high. Um, I can't speak for the systems, the federal systems. I have never worked in that system. But I can speak to what I see here in Washtenaw County. And we absolutely have a lot of plea deals um, that are happening. And I think that it boils down to time and resources and a lack of trust in the system. People don't feel that they're going to actually get a fair trial in Washtenaw County. And that goes to a lot of things. It's um, there are so many charges that, you know, we've got 10 charges stacked against a person and the jury's going to believe at least one, right? So I might as well take my chances and take the plea deal. Um, there, the jury is not made up of a veneer of my peers. You know, overwhelmingly despair is that we have black males as defendants. That jury does not look like them. And there's a distrust in the criminal justice system. We have to acknowledge that. But we also have to acknowledge that we also have the criminal justice system that we have been willing to fund. When we have more time and when we are able to build that trust back, if we've ever had it at all, but if we are able to build the trust between the defense bar and the prosecutors, but we can individually manage each case and we are addressing the root causes, we are finding probably more fair charging and dispositions on cases where maybe we might see a slight decrease in um, pleas, but we, what we might see is a more fair resolution. I'm not saying that it's going to lead to more trials, but we're going to see more resolutions, one, that are not leading to incarceration, but leading to diversion programs, leading to sentences that do not include incarceration, but include rehabilitation, that include restorative justice, that include mediation with the victims. So I think that's probably what we will see in the event that we have this opportunity for true criminal justice reform, which is what I'm working for. Thank you, So that, that high rate of cases disposed via plea bargaining, it's an equity issue. Because think about the people that are coming through the criminal justice system. Oftentimes they don't have money. Because of our broken and inequitable cash bail system, often when they are offered a plea, they've been sitting behind bars because they can't afford to get out for days, weeks, months. They need to get back to their families. right? And they may be more likely to accept a plea and actually to plead guilty to a crime that they didn't commit because of that coercive bail system that preys on the existing socioeconomic inequity. The other thing is how we're conducting plea bargaining. I have taken a stance against coercive plea bargaining. Coercive plea bargaining happens when the prosecutor comes and they threaten charges, they threaten aggravators that they couldn't possibly prove up at trial in an effort to get the case to go away, to get, to get a guilty plea, um, to get the person to serve the time that they think they would have been able to get at trial anyway. My stance as prosecutors, we are going to end coercive plea bargaining. If you are threatening something in a plea bargain negotiation, it had better be something that you can prove up beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. So we are going to level the playing field when there are plea bargaining negotiations. In addition to that, because I support cash bail reform, we're going to end the coercion where you feel oftentimes like you have to accept a plea simply to get on with your life because you're sitting in jail because you're poor. <laughs> the other thing that's important is oftentimes with plea bargains, you see a waiver of rights. And what that means is, is a defendant may have to waive their rights to an appeal if they, you know, they think that their, their initial stop was unconstitutional, tainted by racial bias, an unreasonable search or seizure, or if they think that something went wrong with the process. I don't believe in that. Even if somebody pleads guilty and we get a plea deal in place, I think we should be preserving the due process rights to appeal, because ultimately that's how we're going to root out inequity and unconstitutional actions in our justice system. You don't do any good by just sweeping them under the, under the rug, forcing somebody to take a plea bargain, and pretending like the issue doesn't. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you either now or in your purses or wallets, you've got a dollar bill, five, ten, whatever, dollar bill. And the reason you have that 
and when you go to the store, is because you've got confidence in what that money represents. <coughs> you've got confidence that there's backup when you give that clerk or that gas station attendant that money. Symbolism means everything. So to start at the top with the next prosecutor, a lot of people mistakenly thought that me being in a penitentiary was somehow some kind of a death knell to your public safety. How wrong they are. Because the symbolism that is sent with my election is that the people of this county are progressive and believe in fair and equitable treatment for everyone. Think about that. Think about that. If you're the defendant in a case, and I know people shun defendants, well, be real careful about shunning somebody who's a defendant. That defendant's chair has got everybody's and nobody's name on, on it. Okay? So I don't care what race you are, how much money you think you have, or what social group you think you belong to. You could be in that chair also. Remember that. So now, in terms of that symbolism, in terms of what it represents, it represents with me, as I told you, if you're a defendant, what did I tell you? I told you no overcharging, no railroading, full constitutional rights, fair sentencing. That is how we will address the problem. And in terms of me, I made it real clear. In my office, when I put a charge against somebody, there's not going to be a bunch of plea negotiation because I feel that is the fair charge to protect you, the citizen, and to protect the defendant's rights also. Please remember, it's going to be like a compass pointing north. My number one objective is to keep you and your family safe. I do that with a fair charge. There are individuals who break the law. Those individuals have got to be held to account in a fair and equitable manner. So now, in terms of me, when I talk about bail and bond and those matters, once again, I'm a prosecutor, not a legislator. I can address those issues by having a fair charge. I can address those issues by being sympathetic to mental health and drug problems. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Seidel will be off answering this question. The next question. Hi, my name is John Morley. Uh, I'm a retired software engineer living out in uh, western Washington County near Chelsea. And uh, so I live for uh, uh, data and algorithms and uh, logic. Uh, and so my question is, uh, for, for all three candidates, uh, if you're uh, elected, what data, what metrics will you collect uh, during your time as prosecutors so that you have something to point to when you're up for re-election in four years? Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a data guy myself, so, so I'm really glad you asked. I think the prosecutor's office should be judged on a number of metrics. But first and foremost, we need to be judged by uh, the recidivism rate. If we are continuing to shuffle people in and out of our jail and prison system, that is a failure of the prosecutor's office, it is a failure of the justice system. Fundamentally, what I believe in is, as I said, addressing the root cause of criminal behavior uh, so that people don't recidivate, so that crimes don't escalate. So the recidivism rate is one thing we're going to be tracking very closely. Racial equity, too. That's another thing that the current prosecutor's office does nothing to track. But every time you pull back the curtain on this prosecutor's office, you see severe indicators of racial inequity. I mentioned the incredible disparity in our juvenile justice system. Here's another stat for you. In Washtenaw County, you are 8.5 times more likely to be held in jail on cash bail because you can't afford to pay if you are black and throw away. 8.5 times is the highest disparity any county in the state of Michigan that's conservative. So we're going to be tracking racial equity metrics because I fundamentally believe that, yeah, you've got to have some consequences sometimes for, for behavior, but you should be uh, subject to those consequences because of what you did, not because of who you are. And I want to say something else about this. We are going to make our data transparent. If you go on the Washington County Prosecutor's <coughs> website right now, there is no data. There are no metrics. There is no indication of whether it is doing a good job. I urge you to look at the Philadelphia District Attorney's <coughs> Office, which has all the charts, all the metrics, all the data uh, you could ask for. Kim Fox out in Chicago has made all files available to researchers so that they can uh, run their own regressions on things. We work for you, and the prosecutor's office should be held accountable as to whether <coughs> they are serving the community. It will all be accessible to you, and you can make a decision in four years. Ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the succinct answer to the question, we address it first and foremost by being ministers of justice. A lot of people don't realize 
The highest court in this land has referred to a prosecutor as a minister of justice. A minister of justice. That means that not every case that comes across my desk is going to be filed because it is not in the interest of justice. In terms of having data available, that's wonderful if the monies and resources are available. Part of my job as your next prosecutor is not only to protect you and your families, but to protect your tax dollars. And I can't make you promises about having a bunch of data available to you that I simply can't pay for. We will do the best we can. But you can judge me, ladies and gentlemen, not by what other people say about me, but by the fruit that I bear. We're going to have home districting where every member of my staff, and if they don't like it, the Donald's time is going to be out and about in the community. So you'll know what your prosecutor is thinking. Your prosecutor wants to hear from you. And furthermore, in terms of symbolism, we're going to address this. I <coughs> remember this attempt to remainder this campaign. Under my administration, no community will be underprotected and disrespected. I'm going to say it again. No community underprotected and disrespected, whether that's Celine or West Willow, whether that's Chelsea or the south side of Ypsilanti. That's how we're going to do. We're going to be a living, breathing billboard of the Minister of Justice. That will engender trust in the system, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what we have a problem with, particularly in the African American community. There is a distrust of the police, with rightful so. Perhaps that's why I'm not getting a bunch of support from the police, because I've made it clear. I'm going to restore a partnership with the police, not a friendship. You see, friends cover for each other and make excuses. The prosecutor's job has never been to be the friend of the police. It's to be a partner. I cannot be the friend of the police. I'm going to have to charge them one day for hurting one of you. That's how straightforward and upfront I am about this. Make no mistake about it. So in terms of me, oh, excuse me, I apologize. Um, in terms of data, I think uh, being able to account for our diversion out of the criminal justice system will be exceedingly important. So being able to account for those we divert from mental health for substance abuse and through restorative justice will be exceedingly important. We did talk a little bit about um, the prosecutors having that ability to uh, lobby for certain causes up in Lansing. One of those will be to amend some legislation that gives CJIS, that's part of the state police, that allows us to be a little bit more transparent with our data. That is a hurdle that we have, but as prosecutor, that's something I will lobby for so that we can do as other states do and put some more of that information out there to be transparent with our community. But I think as if we start showing that we have success stories and reduce recidivism because we are circling the wagons around our most vulnerable population, people who are truly in crisis, I think that will be speak, will speak volumes and that will show our community and what we need to be investing in in the future, which is more programs for restorative justice, more programs for diversion for mental health and for substance abuse, and that we are treating this as true wellness, not funding, additional funding into the criminal justice system. Thank you so much. Mr. Mack will lead off answering this question. Hello, my name is Alan Haber. I live in Ann Arbor. I'm a basic activist. Many, many, each of you have spoken one way or another as to your limitations by what the statutes allow, what the judges allow, and so on. In the bigger picture, the Constitution says all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. That's Article 6, Clause 2. Specifically, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights are all the law of the land, the law of our county. Generally, prosecutors, judges, locals don't pay any attention to the global international context of a increasingly civilized humanity for which we hope. How would you see, in your role as prosecutor, the education and implementation of these three treaties, covenants, laws of the land in our county. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as your next prosecutor, my job is law enforcement. 
and the supreme law of the land is the Constitution. But I enforce it within the confines of, of statute, within the confines of law. I personally believe in the fairness and equality of all people in the elimination of racism, okay? But the question is, how can I put that belief into proper context and execution? One, by treating people fairly. As I said, if you're the defendant, no overcharging, no railroading, full constitutional rights, fair sentencing. That is how I embody the issues this gentleman has addressed. In terms of your prosecutor, how do I embody what he says? By being a minister of justice. Under my watch, if I have anything to say about it, there's not going to be any racial disparagement. Police are not going to be able to exist in a system where they do what they want and the prosecutors got their back. You see, that's been a problem so far. We're going to put an end to that compared with 2021. <coughs> how I embody what this gentleman said is understanding the humanity of us all and the right of us all to a future that God has given us. And I am going to be the last person in the world to aid and abet an actually innocent person going to the penitentiary. I've been there, done that. I understand. I get it. So I'm going to protect those rights, ladies and gentlemen. But we have a state constitution we've got to uphold also, which has very similar precepts. And I'm sure I, and I don't speak for my opponents, but I'm sure we have a very fundamental belief in the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Michigan, and we'll uphold it. So that is how we address these issues. Every case has got to be viewed separately. I want to make this very, very clear. Because a person is poor doesn't mean they're capable of committing crime. Because a person is mentally ill does not mean they're capable of committing crime. It means we have to take these matters into consideration. But my concern, I'm going to keep saying it, is for the safety of you and your families. We're going to protect you first and deal with these issues as we come up through. This slide. Um, of course, we will all, I think we can all agree that we're going to abide by the Constitution, the state Constitution, and every statute. But what I think uh, you might be getting at is context. So I am a trainer at heart. I um, have taken the responsibility since I've been a prosecutor to train uh, coming up prosecutors, baby prosecutors, and I spend about a day every month teaching the new prosecutors over the state of Michigan and some of our local prosecutors here on how to go forth to be equitable, how to do things procedurally correct. And I take on interns whenever I have the opportunity so that they are coming up with the proper context so that they are embracing equity. They are embracing inclusion and they are embracing what we are in everyone in this room that the Dems are really fighting for in 2020 and I do that also not just for the prosecutors but for the police their training initially is very different than what you have in a traditional forum and what you know we probably all got in law school and some of that needs to be untrained a little bit um, and so context is everything. And I teach at the police academy. I wrote the curriculum over at, uh, for MCOLS, which is the governing board for domestic violence and interpersonal violence. Being able to come into a situation with not just empathy, but for an eye of discernment to make sure that you are embracing what the law says, not taking your own personal judgment and putting your own perception on it. That is the trick, that is the key. But that's what I can bring forth in 2021. Um, well, well, I'm glad to hear everybody up here say that they will follow the supreme law of the land, uh, the federal constitution as well as the state constitution. Because actually, I want to say this. This is something that prosecutors across the state of Michigan have not been doing in a very particular context. Supreme Court of the United States, in the case of Miller versus Alabama, held that life sentences without the possibility of parole for juveniles was presumptively unconstitutional. Uh, four years later, in Montgomery versus Louisiana, they doubled down on that and said that every juvenile lifer in the country had to be resentenced. The Supreme Court's statement, the explicit statement, was juvenile life sentences should be exceedingly rare. And so prosecutors across the state of Michigan had a choice. What do you do with all these people that you obtain life sentences for? And across the state, including here in Washington County, the recommendations by prosecutors, despite the Supreme Court's admonition that these need to be really rare, was basically to say, yeah, all of them should be resentenced. 
to life in prison. Here in Washington County, the initial recommendation was 100% of our juvenile red lifers should be resentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Now, the courts disagreed with all of them, and all of them were actually resentenced to a term of years. We've got this problem across the state of Michigan, where prosecutors think you know, they've got their own little kingdoms, and they don't need to pay attention to what the Supreme Court of the United States says because they know best. I disagree. With respect to the treaties that you mentioned, with respect to the evolving standards of decency, uh, and the Supreme Court has said we need to look internationally for that in terms of the punitiveness of our sentence, in terms of how we are treating juveniles, young people in sentencing, that needs to be A1 at the top of the list. It's legally required, moreover, I think it is ethically required to take account of what, uh, you know, not just we're doing here in the United States, what the science shows us, and what uh, the rest of the world is doing with its justice system too, because we are a laggard in this. We have the highest rates of incarceration of any country in the world, and that is a shame to this country. Thank you very much. We have time for two more questions. Um, Ms. Slay will answer the first answer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonah Hahn. Uh, it's a simple yes or no question, and then I would like you to explain why you say yes or no. Uh, do you believe that the office of the prosecutor should be endowed with funds to prevent incarceration and support reentry, or do you believe that those funds should be directed at community-led initiatives? Yes, kind of. Um, I think that that's kind of a tricky one. Um, I think it probably should be more in the hands of the community, but I think it would be great for the prosecutor's office to have a seat at the table. Um, if we understand what the community is looking for, if we understand what the opportunities are in the community, that they can help those who are re-entering in, um, back into our community, then we can know what to look for and how to help advocate for that in sentencing. Um, we can look for that um, in knowing what our, um, for example, I sit in the um, mental health treatment court every Wednesday. And in our uh, small circle of wagons, uh, Avalon housing is there, uh, NAMI comes to court every week, uh, Dawn Farm is there, we have the Shelter Association and a criminal defense attorney, the judge, and the prosecutor's office where everyone's sitting there and we're talking about what's going on and how we can help. And if somebody is missing from the table, then we invite them to find out what service is needed. It is always a funding issue. There is always somebody we wish we had at the table, but because of funding issues, they're not there. So the funding should be with our community partners. However, to keep the prosecutor in the loop so that we can continue to advocate for maybe the orders that are necessary for support or the orders that we would need the judge to advocate. Judge, we really would love it if you could order fill in the blank treatment program because then that's how the funding comes through. So the prosecutor having a seat at the table is probably the most important part, not necessarily that they have the funding, but we would need the funding to be able to staff it. So a little bit of funding to maintain the staffing so that we can participate in those programs, but the majority of the funding so that the community actually gets the service. Thank you. Um, actually, kind of same answer, yes-ish. Uh, I think I think that the prosecutor's office, if we're going to be expanding uh, what we do, particularly you know under my proposal around expungements, around you know put, uh, supporting and staffing up diversion programs and the drug courts, perhaps needs a little bit more funding. But fundamentally, I think that reentry, I think that community services should be provided by community groups that know what they're doing. Because again, we're all lawyers here. Uh, we're not psychologists. We're not substance abuse specialists. We're not social workers. We're not. Well, I, was a, I was a teacher, but I'm not sitting up here with my educator hat on. Uh, we don't work in schools, right? Those are the organizations that should be getting the money, uh, and and those are the organizations that are really at ground zero of preventing recidivism and preventing crime from happening in the first place. So as I said, the first. Not lawyer that I hire in the prosecutor's office is going to be a grant writer. And I anticipate that they are not going to be working primarily on grants for the prosecutor's office. They're going to be working to get resources into the community, into these support groups, into schools, um, into mental health treatment centers, hospitals, uh, substance abuse treatment centers, and the like, so that we can really build up together a community that we can be proud of. Mr. Mack. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I remember me telling you that part of my responsibility as your next prosecutor is not only to protect you, but your tax dollars. So everything that I talk to you about are things that I know I can do, not that I wish I could do. Let's talk about what I can do as your next prosecutor, okay? In terms of reentry, I told you, I've already met with the Michigan Department of Corrections, okay? And I've already made arrangements, should it be your will to let me prosecute, to have a summit with the Michigan Department of Corrections in my office for all chambers of commerce, all employers within the county to extol the virtues of hiring somebody coming back from the penitentiary. People who have something to prove in terms of their trustworthiness. That does not cost you one dollar. I would have to apply for a grant to do that and say, I wish I could do it. I can do that. Furthermore, in terms of the monies, I believe these monies probably should go to community organizations. I believe, I agree with Mrs. Swain in this regard, that the prosecutor should have a place at the table. But I also believe, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to be very careful in delineating what a prosecutor does and does not do. I can be an advocate for social reform and change. But I can't be providing attorneys to write expungements for people. I can't do that. I won't do that. I think it's unethical and it's wrong. We can provide services for those things and refer people to service for those things, but writing them themselves, I just don't think we can do it. And so furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, in, in terms of this, I want you to understand that when we look at this system, and I'm going to keep coming back to this, we are better off as a group than we are separately. And symbolism is important. Showing that we are a progressive county who is willing to put the past behind and focus on the future, give people an opportunity to present their best sides in terms of not focusing on what we think are their darker angels, is what we need to do. And this election is very symbolic of that, ladies and gentlemen. So yes, money should be allotted, and I hope we can get grant money, but I'm going to promise you things I can do right now, not that I hope I can do in the future. Thank you so much. The answer to this last question will be in with Mr. Sadler. Hi, my name is Ruth Cassidy. I'm a resident in Ipsy. Um, and my question is, um, what, how will you work to hold um, the different police departments in Washtenaw County accountable for um, approaching domestic violence situations with a trauma-informed approach? Um, and the worst example of this was in the killing of Aura Rosser by Ann Arbor Police, who was, ex she was experiencing a um, domestic violence crisis. Um, and uh, part two of that question is, um, how would you change um, how the Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office is weaponizing um, zero tolerance policy against uh, youth? Uh, they're saying we have zero tolerance for domestic violence, but in my view, that's not a trauma approach, and I want to know what would you do to change that practice? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll answer the second part of the question first, and, and let me just say this broadly. Zero tolerance policies make for great bumper stickers. You know, you say zero tolerance for domestic violence, you say zero tolerance for gun crimes. Everybody hates those kinds of crimes, right? But you're right, incidents involving kids often are coded as domestic violence when at the end of the day, it's a teenager throwing a temper tantrum. And it's not something that needs to be criminalized. More to the point, I think when we charge kids for adolescent behavior, for a, for a temper tantrum, we actually make mothers, family members, uh, siblings less safe. Because if you think that calling the police when you know, your kid's acting up, throwing a temper tantrum, and, and you might be in danger, your family members might be in danger, if you think that's going to result in your 15 or 16 year old going to the juvenile detention center, which, by the way, doesn't help matters, uh, it makes things worse, you're less likely to report that in the first place. So I don't believe in treating adolescent temper tantrums uh, like crimes. I just don't. I think we do need a trauma-informed approach. I think when it gets to the prosecutor's office, that's an example of where you decline to charge, you get, some, you, you get the kids, the families that are going through trauma services. That is an investment that is going to pay off. Sending the kids into the juvenile detention center, where you know there's a lot of gang members, 
Uh, they're going to build social connections there. Ultimately, that's probably going to make us less safe in addition to disrupting the family's life. Uh, now, to, to the first part of your question, and I'm, and I'm running out of time, but uh, the police absolutely should have a trauma-informed approach to dealing with every situation. It's, it's not something that's directly in the prosecutor's jurisdiction to do, but you know, I, I do believe that when police escalate a situation because they're not going through it for they're, they're not using a trauma-informed approach, that's a situation in which you can decline to charge, uh, and hopefully in the long run, that changes police behavior, but obviously they're not directly under the prosecutor's jurisdiction. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Let me attempt to answer the question this way. First of all, in terms of police, I believe our rules here was brought up. I made it very or Ross, Ross, excuse, me, Ross, excuse me. I made it very clear, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of police. I will never allow a good cop to be crucified or a bad cop to be canonized. I will hold people accountable whether or not they wear a badge and carry a gun. Let me make that real clear. Perhaps that's why I'm not getting a bunch of police endorsements. Because I'm going to stop that love affair that's existed between the prosecutor and the police. I don't know, frankly, what I'd have done in the Rosier situation. I do know that we have a disparate impact of police killing African Americans, and I do know, I've never really seen a case where an African American or somebody else has killed a policeman and there hasn't been a charge, but I've seen a whole lot of cases where police have killed people and there's been no charge or acquittal, okay? That's systemic, endemic throughout our system, and I intend to address that with police because remember what I told you, no community will be disrespected and unprotected. I'm going to say it again. No community will be disrespected and unprotected. And having fair enforcement of the law is part of that. Whether you wear a gun or not, I will hold you accountable if you hurt one of my people. I can't put it to you any simpler than that. Now, in terms of the trauma-based training by police, of course we've got to have that. In terms of domestic violence, ladies and gentlemen, my job is to protect people. If somebody's being beaten, hurt, and abused, my responsibility is to protect that person. And I'm going to do that. I want to be fair and equitable about it. And in terms of juveniles, I understand quite well. I was a juvenile public defender for six years. I represented hundreds, hundreds, not thousands of kids, mostly African Americans coming into the system. I understand better than anybody on this platform what it means to see a kid victimized in the juvenile system. So I'm the first and foremost to tell you we've got to address that. 70% of the kids come into juvenile court, African American. Are the kids being treated the same in Chelsea as they are in West Villa? So we're going to address those problems in a fair or compassionate manner. Thank you. This way. Well, first and foremost, I would never classify family violence as a temper tantrum. It is very serious. And family violence will be taken very seriously in my administration. And when you have young people who are exhibiting signs of violence where the authorities need to be called, that is a family issue where we will wrap our arms around that family and give them the services because every resident in Washtenaw County deserves to be safe in their own home. And every child deserves to be safe in their own home. And if they have a reason to act that way, then something else is going on. And that will be taken seriously. In terms of trauma-based interviewing, I helped write the protocol for lethality assessments that is going live this month for every police agency in Washtenaw County. And we will be having risk assessments that every law enforcement officer will be doing at every call for intimate partner violence going forward. And that they will be there to not only use trauma-informed interviewing techniques, but they will also be there to know when to call community mental health and their crisis team. Because our police officers are not social workers. And we need to be working collaboratively. We need to bring forth our community partners and strengthen our relationships. Because everyone deserves to be safe, whether they are in crisis or whether they have been suffering for five minutes or 15 years. We cannot ask our police officers to go into a situation and fix it in 30 seconds for something that has been brewing for a decade. We need to work together on this issue. I am committed to ending family violence. And you know what? I will stop when everyone in Washington County is safe in their own home. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for all being here. I'd like to thank everyone 
uh, for enjoying this new year. I'd like to thank the people on my campaign committee, my lovely wife, for being here with me. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got some very serious problems in front of us. We've got the opioid epidemic. We've got the ubiquitous crack epidemic. We've got this tremendous state of shootings, ladies and gentlemen, uh, primarily in the African-American community. We've got these drug dealer shootings, all right? We've got home invasion. We've got carjackings. We've got problems, ladies and gentlemen. Those problems are very serious. This is not the time to relegate the resolution of those problems to a social experiment, ladies and gentlemen. Let me make it real clear where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the perspective of a law enforcement officer. My responsibility is first and foremost to protect you and your families. That is the most important thing. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you can't attend the rally to end cash bail if you're terrorizing your community, scared to leave your home because some thug is going to break in. You can't attend a rally in Lansing to address sentencing guidelines reformation if you don't have a car because someone has stolen it or you're afraid to go anywhere for fear of being the victim of a crime. You can't attend social reform for equity and housing, all right, and, and disparate impact of income in terms of the criminal justice system. If you're consumed with fear for your children going to school, your parents in their home, your grandparents on public transportation. My plea to you is, let me make you safe. I've told you about my attitude toward addressing criminality in a fair and compassionate manner, but a manner that is designed to protect you and your family. Once you let me make you safe, God bless you. All of you free to come to hearings like this, knowing that your prosecutor cares about you. Judge a tree by the fruit that it bears, not what somebody tells you about it. So ladies and gentlemen, that is what I offer you, restorative justice in its purest form. And unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to talk about the different categories of people that we're going to bring restorative justice to, but I'll be here at the end of the conversation here, and we can talk some more. Thank you. Thank you. The social experiment that we have been engaged in for decades and centuries in this country is mass incarceration. It has been a failure and it's imposed real human costs. We've talked a lot about policy today in general terms, but there is a human face to all of this. And I've been privileged to hear stories on the campaign trail about how our justice system is not working. Slip right. Think about uh, the woman that came up to me, reached out to me and told me that her brother had been in jail or prison every year since his 13th birthday. The first time he was sent into the system was when he was 11 years old for running away from home. What if we could turn back that clock instead of treating that kid punitively, instead of damning him to a life in and out of the system, and giving him the resources that he needed, address the underlying trauma, help that family heal. That's what this is about. I think about somebody that came up to me just before Christmas and said, we just had to bail out for $500. A man, a father, who was in the Washtenaw County Jail for 240 days, $500 cash bond for a nonviolent property crime he couldn't afford to get out, missed his kids' birthdays, missed Thanksgiving. We had to have the Detroit Justice Center come in into Washtenaw County with all the stuff they've got going on in Detroit and charitably bail this man out of prison, or out of jail, so he could enjoy Christmas with his family. There are real human stories, real human costs, across this inequitable, unjust, and counterproductive system we have been maintaining in this county and this country for decades. I am committed to reforming it. I ask you all to please stay involved with these efforts together I am confident we can build a justice system we can be proud of. Thank you. I come to you with my experience. I have been a public servant since I started working um, for the county in 2005. And I have learned from the bottom up as to how we reform. I have not just read about this. I haven't gone and just learned about it on the campaign trail. 
I have watched and learned and I have seen where we have gone wrong and I will bring you experience-based reform. I will bring you the reform that will work. And it's not just the reform that's going to work because I thought about it and I planned it out and I wrote about it. I've been doing it for the last two years in the city of Ann Arbor. I have been diverting cases out of the criminal justice system. I have been using restorative justice. I have been doing this, and at the same time, I have been training our police to be better. I have been training our prosecutors to be better. But I can only do so much from the vantage point when I am. I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to come back to the county and lead. I'm ready to bring forth this culture of change, but do not get it twisted. We are not going back to business as usual at the county. When I come back to the county prosecutor's office, know that things will change. But we are not going to ignore that there is still crime that has happened. I'm not going to just ignore the fact that we have had 33 open homicides. I know how to deal with those too. Now, I have prosecuted everything from trespass to murder. I have done that, and I will deal with that too. You will be safe in this community, but you will be respected, and you will be treated equally. I am here for you as a public servant, and I'm not going anywhere. My husband, Sean, and I are raising our children here. We are lifelong county residents, and we are not going anywhere. We are here for you. And if you're not afraid of my germs, come on up and ask me any questions you want. <laughs> Thank you for taking your Saturday morning to be with us. Go Dems in 2020.